it's 5 30 so we're going to go ahead and get started i'd like to call our uh, regular monthly meeting to order for november and if everyone at this time would please join me in a moment of silence thank you everyone please stand and say our pledge <coughs> I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. Board members, um, we are now down to approving the agenda. And um, we do have an amendment to our agenda tonight. <coughs> and I'm going to make a motion to amend the agenda by adding item J to consider job posting of school based mental health care provider. I'm going to have a second by Mr. Jogar. <coughs> All in favor of amending the agenda by adding item J, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? <laughs> Are there any other additions to our agenda tonight? If not, I will need a motion to approve the amended agenda. I'll make a motion to approve. A motion by Ms. Wells. Second. And a second by Mr. Bowers. All in favor of approving the amended agenda item, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I hear right, We'll move down now to recognitions. Ms. Embry. Good evening, board members and guests. Let me share my screen. All right. This past month has been filled with special celebrations across the school district. So I'm going to mention a few tonight. Uh, we had Red Ribbon Week, Kindness Week, and Thanksgiving Meals. Uh, first, I want to begin with the National Red Ribbon Week runs from October 23rd to the 31st every year. This year's theme was drug free looks like me and the executive committee of Stan shared a few ways to spread this message. Members visited each elementary school to greet students and share a message during the morning announcements and they were so excited to do that. It was fun to see these little ones looking up to um, our high school students as well. And on Wednesday, the uh, 28th, we designated that across the district as red day. So we saw lots of red that day. Then on November the 8th through the 12th, we had kindness across the Commonwealth, which led up to World Kindness Day on the 13th. And again, our stand members designated Wednesday the 10th as the high school's day to spread kindness like confetti. They created posters with positive messages and they hung those around the school, along with writing encouraging words to um, fellow students and staff members. You'll see the cards that they wrote there on the bottom of your of the screen. Um, a variety of kindness activities was shared also with all of the schools. There were bulletin boards um, across the school district with uh, positive messages um, throughout each of our buildings. I want to thank the stand members for choosing to be kind. And then this week has been quite an exhausting week. <laughs> I'll give you a moment to enjoy that little turkey there on your screen. <laughs> I spotted that today. I couldn't help take a picture of it. Thank you, Mr. Browning, for the entertainment. I do believe that was a student in maybe fourth grade. Um, I know his name was Liam and they really enjoyed. There's a video under Greenville Elementary's Facebook page. If you'd like to see Mr. Browning seeing that turkey for the first time. Um, but we want to thank our cafeteria <laughs> staff. Beginning on Tuesday with our elementary schools, our cooks, along with a variety of um, other staff members. I was told we had uh, school bus drivers and monitors and we had various staff members throughout our, our school buildings helping out and serving Thanksgiving meals. So on Tuesday, they did that at the elementary schools to all of our staff and our students. 
Then our middle schools and the Renaissance Center enjoyed a Thanksgiving meal yesterday. And then today the high schools uh, shared their meal. And these ladies here um, all together served over 4,000 Thanksgiving meals. We want to say thank you to the cooks. Um, this is it. Be, it continues to be a challenge. Um, Joe Cooper will tell you that it gets interesting at times to find all the supplies that they need. They're having to go and uh, find other sources, grocery stores locally to get all they need to serve those meals each day. But you would never know it by the staff. Um, they do an amazing job. And I just want to say thank you from the Board of Education for providing such a wonderful meal for us. Um, this week and you see Joe and her uh, right hand helper Rachel Nelson there in the picture. Um, so just thank you all and we hope that you have a happy Thanksgiving. That is it. Thank you. Marla. Thank you. All right. Now we move down to our treasurer's report. Mr. Come up. All right. Thank you, Chairman Rager, board members. Uh, tonight I bring you the financials as of October 31st, 2021. Start with revenues. Excuse me. I apologize. Can I just say the reason we're all coughing is uh, Mr. Matt Perkins put some soup in the microwave and it was very spicy soup and it boiled over and cooked itself silly and he's out in the hallway now enjoying the fresh air while we're in here <coughs> coughing. The fan is working. I believe we are making progress. I did apologize. It was an accident. That's all I can say. That's all I can say. I would like to state the fan is working as a matter of opinion. <laughs> so our, begin, our beginning balance is uh, 26.68 uh, 26 I can't even think now. 26.688 million, uh, which is up, up by 1.3 million from uh, last month. However, monthly receipts are down uh, 3.1 million from last month and up 216,000 from the same period last year for a total of 2.99 million. Uh, really, the every um, category is down. Uh, I'd also like to mention, you know, taxes. We expect that you know that that'll be higher next month with uh, all the tax bills that went out, um, as well as uh, the federal, it's down, you know, three million because we had a, a large federal crash request because we were able to finally get a hold of some of the ESSER funds as they were <coughs> approved through the state. <coughs> so with that said, we are we're now um, starting to tap into some of our ARP ESSER refund so a lot of it's going into salary and i'll expand upon that in just a moment uh, so for our total revenues with cash securities and receipts of 29.678 million expenditures uh, this month accounts payable was 1.74 million uh, of that it was up it was up approximately 195,000 compared to the same period of last year uh, the significant bill in October was 863,922, which was to old national for debt service. Payroll is was uh, $2,797,975. I uh, just want to look, that's up $179,000 versus October of 2020. However, this is where, um, while we're trying to use ESSER funds on everything except salaries where, where we can, um, and that's because federal health funds when we have the federal health plans we have to match those those dollars that are put in and they are significantly higher so basically I calculate approximately eight thousand dollars an employee that I pay uh, out of federal <coughs> funds so that's why we're trying to use those federal funds on, on one-time expenses because those are the things that and we do have three years to expend those funds <coughs> so you know we're, we're trying to be really smart about that and not use it so much on salaries uh, for total expense of 4.54 million in expenses. Uh, further breakdown, the fixed and mixed expenses about 1.3 million. Uh, variable expenses 339,000 and utilities expense 134,000. I did have a uh, intelligence services meeting with train today. I asked them, they 
the data that they're providing me was the savings since 2012. I asked them to give me all the savings numbers since our, our uh, HVAC install. So I'll have that for you guys next month. Okay. So just so you're aware. Uh, we have been seeing, we have been realizing uh, savings on that. So, I mean, it, it has been a, a positive thing. I'm really excited about where we're going with that. So, <laughs> breakdown of 1.737 million. General fund was 507,000. Fund two and school activity funds was about 242,000. Debt service, about 864,000. Food service and daycare, 124,000. The ledger balance at the close of the month was 25.14 million. Uh, and the, the bank balance was 18 million with about 887,000 in outstanding checks for a cash of 17.157. For the breakdown, uh, general fund about 17.2 million. That's down 1.7 million. However, special revenue, this is uh, good to see. It's it's still at a negative balance. However, you'll notice that it's up about almost three million from last last month. So that's a that's a reflection of the federal cash flow. Uh, total is 26.687. So we're down about 1.98. Extended financial picture: uh, We expect to <coughs> have in the bank as of March of 22 about 24.3 million. Are there any questions? Is TBA fund considered in that yet or? in the extent exten yes ma'am okay. yes uh and i have that plugged in i'm not seeing that so i think i plugged it in further down the road okay. so i'll i'll update that and i will talk to, during superintendent report we have met with tva folks and state folks and i'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that later i did i think i pulled that out because we were having that talk and so I, I didn't plug it back in so I, thank you for pointing that out. Well, if it's him and the number. <laughs> no, the TBA funds are not in that number so oh, be, it, it, they probably bring it up about seven million. More. So again, we're, you know, this is something we always stress and I know Robbie's going to touch on this, but we're trying to hold cash because right now we've got projects that we're going to be doing and we're also trying to look to the future when those TBA funds are not going to be there. So we're trying to be diligent with them and not not hoard them, but at the same time, make sure that we do have funds available for future projections that we have really extensively. Where's the construction going on? Excuse me? Where's the construction going on? You got 425,000 in construction? Uh, that's from just uh, building projects that just, I always put that in there just as a contingency, just to make sure if there's, a, if they had something that, that might be, might occur, like a roof that might need well, something. Not an expense. It's not an actual expense on that one, but I'm just trying to project and say what could happen. At the time when I originally started that, I expected to have a cafeteria going a bit right. sooner. So I was kind of hoping that we would be expending that, but yeah, <laughs> and I'd, I'd, I'd rather have those expenses lined out yeah. than not, and yeah. that's not hit with, hit with a surprise there. Any further discussion? If not, I need a motion to approve the treasurer's report. I'll make a motion. I have okay. a motion by Ms. Wells. Second. And a second by Mr. Ballard. All in favor of approving the treasurer's report, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? I hear none. Move down now to payment of bills and salaries. Thank you again, Joe Ray. Yeah. Uh, the November 2021 board bills, uh, I bring $306,531.25. Of that, general fund accounts for $256,000. Fund two, $47,000 in food service and daycare, about, about $2,700. Utilities is 102,000. Fixed and mixed expense about 70, 75, or excuse me, 70,500. Variable expense about 134,000. A significant bill in this one, in this batch, was music and arts. Uh, that's for band equipment. That's, that's also something that we've uh, tried to a lot 
with ESSER funds. That's another one. Of, that's one of those one-time expenses. So we're, you know, allow trying to help a band band program with some of their expenses. So I do expect to see more coming through here that are going to be music expenses. So these are these are good these are good things that you know we have these funds available to that we otherwise wouldn't. So a good expense. So I need a motion to refer payment of bills and salaries. I need a motion. A motion done by Spar. Second by Mr. Gilmore. All in favor of paying bills and salaries, please say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll move it down now to um, public participation. Easier when I can do, watch it online. I don't want to get smoked out. Uh, <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> it's an initiation. Yeah. So, uh, I don't know if it's a bless or blessing or a curse, but I guess I'm the first person to speak in the last at least two years that I've been watching the board meetings for the public participation section. Uh, and I'm going to try to keep it five minutes. Mr. Davis asked five minutes. And with uh, Smoke still in here. I'm not sure if I can talk that. Much. So I did make notes so I can do this and go over quick. Um, so good evening, Chairman Gregor and board, Mr. Davis. My name is Jeremy McGill and I reside in the third educational district. And my wife and I are the parents of a kindergartner and a senior who's a legal adult. And both are enrolled in the Muhlenberg County School System. Comments that I make tonight are my own and are to be considered my own, not those of my wife, who's an employee of this district. Don't think that's going to be an issue. Um, seems that many would resort to social media and the keyboard to express concerns to, to elected board members. And I'm not convinced that that's always uh, the way to yield positive results. Uh, as a matter of fact, it's typically it turns negative. So that's why I'm standing here tonight uh, to speak on agenda item 10i, consider COVID related protocols. And I'm asking you to consider reinstating the policy this board held as of July 16th, 2021 until August the 9th of 2021. And that allows me as a parent to make the choice of whether my five year old wears a mask for eight hours a day while he's present at school. I'm fully aware of the timeline and chain of events that have occurred that have rendered this policy to be placed solely back in your all support or control um, in the hands of the local elected board. And the Kentucky General Assembly, they didn't move this policy through the House, Senate, Circuit Courts, and ultimately the Kentucky Supreme Court because they were bored. Uh, they did that because of hundreds of thousands of concerned parents across the Commonwealth, like myself, that asked for this to happen. So, and it's specifically based on local control, as you know now. And in my opinion, as your constituent, local control begins in the living room, not this boardroom, when it pertains to the health decisions regarding my five-year-old. And I guarantee you no one in this room loves or cares more for my child than I do. So I don't intend to stand here and debate the scientific lack of effectiveness of masks on children, um, none of that. I do have a postgraduate experience in reading and analyzing statistics and data sets. And the elephant in the room would be the vast number of studies that have come out from across the globe over the last 20 months, and even some states close to home, uh, such as Georgia, Tennessee, and Florida. And those examples and data that we've seen, they clearly point to the fact that my child is not a disgusting little disease vector for SARS-CoV-2 when I have the choice to allow him to wear a mask to school. And if you remember, at first we were told that the actions of these schools in a lot of these states were reckless. And just, just stand by and keep a close eye on them for the doom and gloom that will follow. And what we've seen is that was proven to be foul advice because anyone who's been keeping an eye on those states, like we were instructed to, to wait and see, 
and clearly determined that parent choice has had no negative effects on community infection rates. And to suggest otherwise has proven to be a baseless claim not supported by data, especially now that we've got 20 months worth of studies to look at these areas. So in this county, to what means is there an end? I know that uh, every, every board meeting since um, the September meeting, it's, it's been discussed about developing some type of metric and I understand that and appreciate that. So to what means is there an end? And at this point, the decision 100% truly does rely on with the five of you uh, that represent the people. And as parents here in this county, we were promised that this would be revisited once the sole discretion was finally placed in your all's hands by the Supreme Court and later in special session by the General Assembly. But we've been promised that this will be revisited. And it's also noteworthy that districts across the state, they've asked for input from parents and stakeholders um, regarding local policy, wide based public input, formal survey. And we've seen that in counties close to home, like McCrack and McLean, uh, Butler, and even further away, Pulaski, Lewis, Lincoln, and Lee. And it's, it is somewhat disappointing that this body is yet to ask for local input from stakeholders in, in a public type format. Um, many folks across the state, even across the country, they're focused on a map with colors that indicate arbitrary incidence rates of, by county per 100,000. I know you all discussed this in meetings in the past, and I hope you have, and I'm, I'm sure you stopped to think and maybe question why that a seven day daily average of seven positive tests, asymptomatic or not, can render this county in the red. And why was red not 100 cases per 100,000? Or why was it not 10 cases per 100,000? Why was that number chosen? But however, if incidence rate is gonna be part of a metric, then one should be able to reasonably assume that since on July 17th, when parent choice was a factor, our county incidence rate per 100,000 was 32.7. That was on July 17th. I believe the official press release came out on the 16th or 17th uh, this year that, that parent choice would be the case in the school. Uh, and that remained in place, or in this district, and that remained in place until August 9th, and the local rate was still at 58.3 cases per 100,000. Now, that was the day before the, the now relevant KDE mandate uh, was put into place, but local control was still a factor in this county on August 9th, 58.3 cases per 100,000. So today, the county incidence rate sits at uh, 21.9, I believe, and I'm sure that'll be covered later, 100,000. And 29, 21.9, that's only about six and a half actual cases for the seven day average. And yet, we still don't have a choice as parents in this county. So it's also a tough pill to swallow as a parent when it appears safe for students to play various forms of sports ball inside. Unmasked, close contact, but yet, when there's no scoreboard involved, then it's magically a different situation for my child. I guess it truly shines light on the influence of school athletics associations as compared to an individual concerned parent. Um, also, districts ranging at this point, uh, some as recently as yesterday and the day before, ranging from uh, further away to Kitten, Simpson, Oldham, Union, close, closer, such as McCracken, Marshall, Livingston, Hickman, Callaway, Warren, Todd, Logan, Ohio, and now even Butler had a, a modified uh, masking while setting policy, it seems. Mr. McGill? Yes. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be rude, but you're seven and a half minutes now, so, you know, finish your I, call. I'm, I'm, by all means. I mean, that, the Chairman Rager, is, that's your call, but I'm, I've got here, I'm not trying to, you know, like I said, I'm just. I talk faster when I read this to myself. The smoke could be a factor. <laughs> so, yeah, sometimes. so that's what I'm appealing for. Those those counties have moved to parent choice. Uh, so that's what I'm appealing for. Let my wife and I make this decision for our five-year-old <coughs> child. This body is no longer beholden to the authority of any unelected bureaucrat, Frankfurt or otherwise. And when it comes to decisions on masking children, and I do recognize this body truly does have the best intentions for our children at heart and it pertains to education. I appreciate that. And lastly, um, I do want to thank Mr. Davis for the courteous and professional conversations and correspondence we've had over the last year or so. Um, he has no obligation to respond to me. He's not an elected representative to the school board, uh, but yet he has never ever 
hesitated to return calls or hear my concerns. So, uh, thank you for your time. I realize it's, there's no statute that permits that you have to allow public comment at the open meetings, and uh, thank you for doing that. Thank you for doing that. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman Rager, uh, board members. We'll go over a few things here to give you our numbers for the day. Mr. McGill kind of alluded to some of those, and I'll, I'll add to that just a little bit. Uh, we're not going to have principal's reports tonight. I, I'm, I'm cutting out the most positive part of our, our meeting, but I need to quit doing that. But we've been kind of going long, so they will be back in December if we have a three hour meeting. I'll, I'll promise you that. We continue to move forward uh, with our strategic plan. And I'm, I'm kind of excited where that's going to go. We're going to get a lot of folks to give their input, not just on COVID, just really not on COVID at all. It's just where, where are, what are we doing well? And what do we need to work on? And where do we need to be in five years? So there's going to be multiple groups of folks from parents to community officials, to kids, uh, to staff members, and you know, just several groups that are going to have a lot of input. And then we'll put it all together and, and hopefully by May, we have a finished product, but as of now, we've had two meetings with principals and supervisors, and then we're, we're kind of going to be working out toward, from that. But I'm excited about this. We may hear some things we don't want to hear, um, but that's how we get better. So we're putting ourselves out there, and we'll see where that goes. As you know, we had another accident out in front of the high school. I think it was last week or the week before last. I don't remember. And we have in the past uh, preceding me, I know that they, they try to look at maybe getting a traffic light there. It's just a bad spot for, for our kids and buses coming in and out. And, you know, the, the state folks, whoever that may be, they look at it and say, you know, that it didn't warrant that. Well, we're in a different place now because we've got twice as many kids going in there, twice as many buses. So I reached out to some folks and Will Ward, our sheriff, was the, the biggest help. He had a contact. He knows a guy or a gal. And, and he called and talked to them and, you know, their concern was, well, you know, you don't want to put a light there all the time because, you know, most when school's not in session, you know, that they don't really want a red light there. And I understand that it seems like they could put timers on that and that shouldn't be a problem. He said it was, uh, but regardless, they, they realize there's an issue. They're looking at data again, and hopefully we're going to have a meeting soon. Maybe I can get one of you folks to sit in with us to try to, you know, we don't want to wait till, till a student dies there before we get something done. So we're, we're pushing on that. Uh, Sheriff Ward has been a big help and we'll go from there. We're just kind of letting you know that that's, that's in the works. Our gym floor, finally, uh, it has been completed and, and, you know, so we can start having not just games, but start having PE again. And, you know, thank goodness. It, it, as we get into cold weather, we're going to be able to get inside. It looks great. Uh, very pleased with it. Tommy Middleton did a great job there, but uh, I think we're a full go on that now. And you know, you've seen some of the pictures. I want to let Eric talk a little bit about the cafeteria. We continue to be fairly uh, frustrated with the pace of this from the State Department to the supply issues. It's just been one thing after another. And I'll tell you, and I know Eric, you can you can add to this, but he, you know, Originally, we were hoping we were going to come in. Bids open next, I think, next week. Is that right? And we were hoping for under two million. And now I think we would be somewhat pleased if it's under three. And it's the supply issue, and it's it's getting the equipment and getting the folks to come. It's a terrible time to be adding on. Of course, we didn't know this when we started this whole process. But just being open and honest, uh, it, it it's not it's just not a good time. So. Eric, if you would just talk a little bit about where we are with that and, and Absolutely. anything you have. We had a pre-bid meeting on Monday where wherein the contractors can come out to the, the site and inspect everything in, in terms of uh, grounds, electrical, plumbing, all those sorts of things. They, they walked all through that. We are planning to open up bids on Tuesday. Um, and at which point, uh, you know that will be it'll be brought to you all to, to select somebody we are um, 
we did just a lot of the things that, that we've been waiting on, which is kind of ironic that I'm on the uh, facilities task force as well, is where we got to kind of vent some of these things where we can say, you know, this is what this are our, our, our issues because we wanted to have this going, you know, last like in June and have even have ground broke, you know, and I made the joke with Miss Bumps that I'm about to paint a shovel of gold and go out there with her and we're going to take some pictures with our phones and do some groundbreaking ourselves. But uh, but on a serious note, we, we are we just received some approvals from the state. Um, we will we'll, we'll be bringing contracts and those things to you in, in the future, and we do hope to have something broken by by January. With that said, I mean, as, as Robbie mentioned, you know, supply chain, it is a huge issue, which is it's driving up costs, it's driving up timelines. Um, you know, I overheard some of the electrical folks talking about they can't get a, a service, you know, a, a 400 amp service to even get electrical to a, a place. One one gentleman mentioned that he he robbed one from a, one job that he was working on because they were behind on other things to put the 400 amp service no hoping that just stuff that, you know, you would never, ever imagine uh, being an issue is now an issue. Uh, and, as Mr. Davis mentioned, you know, the original projection was about 1.5 million. I'm going to be happy if it comes in at three. So um, again, this is another thing where we have been holding cash. Uh, Robbie and I had a, a very good conversation with our, our bonding agents last week, uh, RSA. Uh, we do have SFCC dollars that we're going to be using that for this project, it's about $750,000. But in order to not borrow money, we're going to use cash. And so that's something that we are, we're going to do to be very diligent with because in the future, we want to be able to have that bonding capacity available. So we have the cash to do it. It's smarter to use cash when you can. So that's what we're going to do. And Just then, for the difference though? Excuse me? Just for the difference, right? Right, for the 2.25 the um, or whatever that might be. or. The, Whatever that whatever that figure might be, uh, you know, if, if we have to come up with some creative means to say, you know, because I'm going to start plugging in numbers into my projections and saying, OK, what mix of financing is going to be best for our district uh, in the long term? Uh, you know, obviously I can sit here and say we're going to use cash and and if I run some numbers and I think mm, I may want to just use Two million cash or 1.5 cash, and then finance. You know, have a small bond. Um, our bonding capacity in about three years is going to significantly increase, and we want to be able to hold that. Uh, I'm going to hold that close so that we can we can have options in the future where we need to build things. So that's that all kind of ties into the the cafeteria. I know I'm going down a different rabbit hole, but as we get moving on this, that's what we're looking at. So. All right, thank you, Eric. As I said a little earlier, uh, Eric and I met with representatives on a Zoom call, representatives from TVA and from the State Department, uh, several from each. And so what we have learned, you know, we've talked in the past that it seemed often that TVA and our State Department didn't talk a lot because we'd go to I've been in Chattanooga, been in Knoxville, been to Lexington, Frankfurt, wherever. It's like, what did the other one say? And that's Quite honestly, it's been a little frustrating, you know, when you try to budget. And we've been all over the board. If you remember, you know, we dropped all the way. They told us we were going to get 1.3 million, and which is basically shaving six million off of our budget. And uh, that was hard months there, trying to live through that. But somehow, uh, after some talks or whatever, we got back to a better spot. We were at 7.3 million last year. So the big question is, when is Unit Three going to come off the books? When's the new gas plant, which is smaller than the other, but when is that going to go on the books? So the meeting started with the guy that's in charge of, of demolition. And so he was uh, spot on. And I'm not thinking whatever this guy gets ready to say in the next few seconds is going to change our district in a big way, potentially. And he said what I, kind of what I wanted to say. Uh, basically, he said Unit 3 will be on the books for five more years. Uh, final demolition, I think he said 26, 27. Uh, that's tremendous news. And the good news is when the State Department is on there too, then you can turn to the next little square and say, okay, does that mean what I think it does? You know, we still have 
uh, a good check coming to the state. And so Muhlenberg looks like they're going to be solid where we've been last year, which was again around seven million. And they said, yes, that's that's absolutely the way we interpret that. Now, until you have that check in hand, just like this cafeteria, we can talk cafeteria all day long. We still don't have anything. So we're a little worried about it. But, you know, it felt really good to hear that. And then so so we look we're hoping. All right. We're solid for five years. That gives us time to mitigate time to think things through time to be wise with, uh, you know, making a plan rather than, oh, my goodness, it's, it's right now. The other thing is the, the gas plant. They've already spent one hundred and sixty eight million here out of the proposed five hundred million. And so the, the next question is the end of the next screen. All right. Is that going to help us this year? And we did not get a, uh, I won't say a straight answer. They didn't know. They're like, well, it depends on which bucket it goes in. If it goes in manufacturing, it's not helpful. If it goes in something else, it is. But we're looking them in the eye and saying, we need it to go in our bucket <laughs> if possible. I need you to come down and drive around with me in this county and see our kids and where they live and the importance of every dollar for these these kids. So they're not going to break any laws or change anything, but maybe all ties will go in our favor because we are making some relationships and trying to plead our case. But that can only help. And next year, he said there will be, Eric, make sure I'm correct on this, jump in if I say it wrong, but he said next year, uh, 350 employees will be working on Unit 3 and they'll be in the county the entire year. But that's huge. That's huge for local businesses. That's just huge for the county, period. And so what I'm seeing is we've got five years of unit three on there. Either this year, or I would think certainly next year, we're going to start seeing the benefits of the new gas plant. So we're going to have a, a, a window there where it's going to be plus plus. And it feels like seven million ought to kind of be the floor. And I hate to say that, and it comes in at 5.2 some way, but I'm simply going by what they told us. The other thing, and we don't know what this year's check's going to be, but uh, the person in charge of sales or that's watching over that, they said that the state, the, the check coming to the state this year will be $2 million higher than last year. They haven't really released that yet. That was kind of ballparking it because sales across the nine state region were higher the last year than it was the previous year. We're not going to get all $2 million of that. We get a chunk of a chunk of a chunk. But nevertheless, those are three things, at least for right now, that I see. It. I see pod now. I'd rather. I'd rather Unit 3 there for 10 years, but when you thought of, we thought it was going to be off this year, I mean, you're talking about a $30 million difference in the county in our school district, and this also benefits the county. So felt pretty good about that. It felt really good after that meeting, actually, and, you know, I thank Eric for helping arrange that meeting and, and get those people on board, and uh, they were very helpful and, and answer questions, and I feel like we can reach out to them anytime, you know, so hopefully uh, they absolutely know what they're talking about. And uh, all that comes to fruition. So I did want to mention that, you know, you're kind of cautiously optimistic, I guess is the best way to say that, but certainly sounds better than it did a year or so ago. I want to talk about terrorist metrics just a little bit. I'm going to turn this over to Julie Penley in just a second. I've been talking about this for a bit. Obviously, more than ever, we have uh, kids with mental health needs. I mean, COVID has just been really rough on in so many respects. and. You know, even before COVID, we had so many needs. We have more now, and Terrace Metrics is a way for us to help identify those kids so we can, you know, they're not falling through the cracks. That's the worry. It's the kids that you don't hear from, you're not, you just don't know. And so all of our kids will be taking, you know, the survey. I'm getting into Julie's realm, and she's better at this than me. So I'm going to go stop and turn it over to Julie. And Julie, if you would, talk, talk a little bit about this in general and then where we are with it now. <laughs> this is an awkward silence. <laughs> She's in a smoke filled room. It's better than the smoke. You only pop? I hate not to have this, but uh, maybe she'll pop on here in just a little bit. I know she was going to talk about this. Well, I'll tread water here for just a few seconds. Uh, it, anyway, all of our kids will take basically a bit of a survey with parent. Basically, parents can't opt out if they so choose. Most aren't. And once you get it in, you get the data back, and then it determines, all right, what level are they on? And if they're at the, like the, the worst level, red, 
they have to be talked to. They have to have counseling within 24 hours. So uh, we're just starting this. I'm back, I'm back. Sorry. She, she is here. So, okay, back to you, Jim. I don't know what happened. I'm a lot happened here. Thank God you weren't here. <laughs> <laughs> or survivors. Yeah. I think she's gone again. Yeah. I won't. We won't belabor the point. It's okay, Julie. I think I've done a really good job <laughs> uh, explaining this. Uh, so this is something you know. Mental health, mental health, mental health. We we're talking all the time. What can we do better to our kids? It's more than just math. It's more than just those things. And um, we are trying to address that and we do have a problem and, and many districts do but this is one way we think we can help with that uh, before i get into our numbers i must say that today is the sherry miller's birthday so we yeah, recognize that now that is on on uh, on it's recorded our numbers as of now uh as of today the latest i can have get is uh students we have eight positive students in 30 quarantine that's up just a tick I think we were maybe four and 29 a couple three days ago staff members we have three positives in one quarantine now obviously we want zero and zero but this is uh this is pretty encouraging considering where we were at one point our staff mem numbers have held pretty solid through the whole thing but we were as high as 88 students and 500 quarantine so put those numbers in perspective we are definitely trending in the right direction which is you know one of the reasons we're going to start having you know more conversations about when do we do something different but these are positive these are i want to say positive these are encouraging our positivity rate in the state something i look at each day as well it's at 6.24 percent and remember that's uh, out of all the cases i mean all the tests 6.24 percent of them are turning up positive that number is helpful but it's not the end all but it is a number i look at it's been as low as uh, a little over five it dropped quite precipitously to that and then it's it's pinched up just a little bit to six so it's kind of kind of hovering in that range our incidence rate as mr mcgill said is 21.9 today today is two full weeks in the orange today is the last day of that we did get as low as about 13. we've been 18 or 19 and and 21.9 and it is true that it doesn't take many cases to try to hold that low to kind of bump you out of it so but we are 21.9 the state average or the state incidence rate is 27.9 so finally we get under the state uh, we we've been late to the to the party on getting into orange for whatever reason talked to ed heath today uh, about the hospital capacity a month ago that was not good at all um, he said today that yes they are starting to see some COVID cases back in there but it is still good uh, there's still have plenty of space and I'm sure uh, Chairman Rager you can speak to what's yeah, going on in Davis County. Our way down and we've got to say a lot coming up, lots and lots of it, nothing that we didn't have. Also, we can so tra training in the right direction is, is certainly encouraging. So that's that's basically, uh, that's all I'm going to go over now. Obviously we have a, a agenda item later to talk a little bit more about masking. I'll go into a lot of other factors and at that point, but and that'll conclude my superintendent report. Uh, unless you guys have some questions at this point. <coughs> Thank you, Chairman Reagan. Uh, just want to uh, go over a couple numbers. Uh, I'm pretty pleased with a couple numbers we're seeing getting back to at the elementary level. Uh, you should have in your packets the, uh, the three month compare first three months comparison chart. And um, on that chart, you also see the enrollments uh, per per month. And, uh, you know, we're seeing some good numbers return back at the elementary level. Pretty pleased with that, challenging those on a regular basis. We love seeing those numbers above 95%, uh, maybe even toward 96 or higher. Uh, still working on the middle school, high school numbers to return. Um, at the bottom there, you're going to see the, uh, the monthly average uh, last month of 92.1. I do want to, you know, say that the, the district enrollment there for the third month, uh, 4217, we had some fluctuations with our uh, job core numbers and our um, our move program. So that's not really to be, be too uh, concerned. I track the attendance on a daily basis. And um, so I've been watching it and it's, it's actually been going back up. 
4225 a few weeks ago, 4233, uh, week before last, 4244. And then this week it's it's taken a bit of a backward dip. So it's it was as of today, it's 4237. And so um, those numbers have improved at that job at the job core, which happened in the overall district. But uh, we do challenge the you know the the schools to help us uh, or stay focused on that, trying to return back to a little bit of normal there. But uh, as Mr. Davis says, you know I'm I'm dealing with a lot of cases where uh, there's some there's some uh, mental health issues going on, and that's leading to sometimes kids not not hanging in there and maybe choosing the homeschool route and this and that. And we, we, we work on that every day and you know we're going to have different strategies to to reinvite those kids back to us you know after they get you know our numbers are improving all the time and that's that's a that's a great selling point too so uh, we hope we can get a number of our kids back and get our role back up uh, are there any questions <coughs> Making improvements, then get the normal back to school. All right, now we'll move down to our board action items. And item A is to consider changing the second interventionist position from classified to certified. Ms. Browning. Uh, good afternoon or good evening, everyone. Um, basically, this is a position when we allocated certain ESSER positions to each school, the schools determined what type of position they needed and some determined that they needed uh, classified positions some determined that they needed certified at the high school they decided at that time that they thought they could better be served by having a classified employee and a certified employee since things um, since they've gotten in school they are asking now for us to be able to change the second interventionist position that is an ESSER funded position from classified to certified so that we would have two certified people um, in place for the remainder of the year. Thank you. Are there any questions? I need a motion to approve. I'd like a motion. I have a motion by Ms. Wells, second by Mr. Bowers. All in favor of considering changing the second intervention position from classified to certified, please say aye. All opposed? I hear none. We'll move down now to item B to consider contract for speech language therapy services. Maybe third time's a charm. Nobody move. I don't know what happened a while ago, um, but I am here tonight to present to you a contract for speech language therapy services. We already had and have a contract in place with McPherson uh, Speech Consulting, but due to some circumstances, we are not able to utilize her as much as we would like. So we've had to go um, searching for additional people that we can work with. And we have found someone who's a previous employee of Muhlenberg County Schools, and her name is JC Dunn. Um, she lives um, a couple counties over, but she is willing to come and work with our students. And so attached in your uh, documents, you see a contract for her uh, along with the hourly rate and the other specifics of the contract. And we do uh, rely on these contracted services to meet the needs of our um, hundreds of students who require speech services. We do have a, a therapist out on maternity leave, and so that has uh, created more of a need for us this year. I hope you all heard that. Yes, they did. I have a motion by Mr. Jomar. Second. And a second by Ms. Farr. All in favor of considering the contract for speech language therapy services, please say aye. Aye. All opposed? <coughs> I hear them. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. And we'll move down now to item C to approve the first reading of the 22-23 school calendar. Mr. Barton. Thank you, Chairman Rager. Uh, bringing to you tonight, uh, consideration of the 22-23 school calendar. I've uh, had two uh, meetings with our uh, calendar committee. Uh, Ms. Wells is is a part of that committee. Uh, that, that committee is made up of uh, members established by state statute and uh, we have a, a good working committee. Um, in discussions with Mr. Davis, we, we talked about uh, 
the number of days we might consider next year and compare and compare it to what other districts in the region are doing. And so we felt like uh, uh, establishing this uh, first draft might consider returning to a traditional calendar versus being on a variable calendar, which we've been on the last two years. And that is a calendar less than 170 days. In discussions with uh, fellow DPPs surrounding districts, many of them are returning to uh, traditional calendars, uh, anywhere from 173 to 175 days. Um, and we also talked to them about where they placed their fall break and spring break. So if you look at in your, your packets there, you probably have a calendar that says DP, DPP number one option. And uh, it's got some color coded blocks there. Um, that is coming out of the committee, our recommendation to the, to the board. And with this, you're gonna get 85 days in the fall, 87 days in the spring. I uh, felt like it was important to balance out the semesters with us being on the block schedule with the high school. Uh, it did go a little bit long in, in December there. Uh, one option had us getting off that 16th and uh, but this option gets us off on the 20th. In a way, feel like the 19th and 20th is a, is a way to wrap up some activities, uh, get a little more instruction, but also provide that assessment time at the end of the semester or so. But one thing interesting about balancing out the days, I do like the fact that we can put a couple days that uh, the kids and staff are off in February and March. Uh, this calendar we're on right now, we have a pretty pretty long run coming through, through uh, February and March. So uh, I do like that for our staff and kiddos. This has a closing day on the 19th of May. And we are required based on the five year average, how many days we have put in as makeup. We are getting down to those low, low numbers where the highest number we've had over the last five years has been five days. So that's, that's good. That is our recommendation. Uh, one other thing, uh, something new that we uh, talked about is it was brought up by our committee, um, specifically our principals and how to help their staff do some professional things. Uh, and other, so some other districts that do this, they have some early release days where there's some professional time for staffs to collaborate a little bit, collaboratively meet, uh, to plan, to train, uh, to do some professional tasks. And so we talked about that, Mr. Davis. Uh, we've talked to them over and over. We feel like if we provide maybe three early release days, that that might be a good try of this technique. Uh, I feel like that that's questioned them one more time today and the principals uh, do support that and, and would like to try that a year. If we don't like it, we come back and say that was a bad idea. We don't include that in future calendars. But again, calendar decision is the board's decision and uh, I'm available with any, any questions you have at this point. I guess uh, I'd ask the question about that and my only concern was you know any disruption to parents kids just getting out a couple hours early and then the impact it would have like on our ability to go like two hours late you know because that will use up some of that time is that correct? It will. Okay. So that was my, my concern I'm willing to try it but that was we go from 13 hours banked to seven. Okay, so. so it does it does drastically change that. That's again, it. We are we are accumulating instructional hours for the year mm -hmm. and we're required to do a number. Mm -hmm. And so we in this current model, we will accumulate uh, so many hours. Yes. <clears throat> Including the three early release, we would we would still have seven hours over. The, the minimum we need. So the first one is to get early release. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it, those are valid questions. Uh, we kind of kicked that around. I'm not on that committee, but obviously Mr. Harrison's talking quite a bit. I, I think it's the way to put that is, you know, this is something to try. And you don't want to ever inconvenient, inconvenience the parents if you can help it. We are giving them nine months lead time. So they can plan for that and I, I, I do see as a principal and as a staff member it would be nice to have 
strategically placed times where you can look at data, you you can do vertical planning, you can do some things while you know, you know, in two or three times. Some districts do it, I think, weekly, and uh, some several times a year. I wouldn't want to jump in that deep. Uh, once we try this, we may come back and the parents say, you know, hey, we absolutely hate this, or the staff may say these aren't as useful as we thought they'd be. And so I would think after this year, it may be one of those things that you know you continually tinker, try to make it better. This could be really good, and it could be something that we find out is not as useful as we would like. But I, I do think it's worth trying on a on a small basis. You know, three days seems reasonable. We place them around the grading <clears throat> periods when there's a you know extra professional time required to finalize assessments and plan for those things. This is our first cats offer of assistance. We get these every year. Just remember, it's, it's for technology purchases. We match those funds. Uh, the first offer was thirty-seven thousand six hundred twenty-seven dollars. Uh, they match equally, or they can be escrowed <laughs> for three years. And I know Chad's department uses this very well. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second. In favor of considering the um, cats off of assistance, please say aye. aye. Uh, all opposed? I hear none. All right, we'll move down now to item E. Consider revised BG1 for the Renaissance Center roof. Mr. Interesting. You'd think we'd uh, we wrap this up last, you know, a couple months ago, but KDE has said no. Um, basically, what it is is the temporary roof that we put on there. I ran it through general fund. That's what I thought we were, should do. Um, KDE did not like that. So, uh, and the rooftop units that I thought were general fund expenses, which they really were. I mean, we did spend them out of general fund. They wanted us to run that through. So when you, the BG5, which is the one that reconciles all the expenses, they said they wanted it that way. Um, that is a, this was a very valid point that I brought up in terms of the uh, task force. I said, the reason why you probably don't have these with other districts, because I didn't know about this, how to do this, and they probably just run it through, but it is what it is. I, I, it, it is a valid something that we need to do, but I've corrected that, I sent all the information into them, so they wanted us to do a revised BG1. So that's the beginning, and then in the next couple months, I'll be bringing you BG4 and BG5. I'm just going to have to jump in here. Eric's doing a really good job uh, being professional, and I, can, I commend you. Uh, it is very, I'm going, to, I'm going to try as well. It's very difficult working with the facilities group at KDE. It is one of the most frustrating groups you work with. Uh, there is a task force. There's multiple things going on to try to revamp it. I'm not saying they're bad people. I'm just saying, you know, it is so hard to do what needs to be done and local groups have decided it needs to be done and you have money for it. And it's still an absolute nightmare. It, it's it's ridiculous. Here I go. I'm going to come off shut her down. <laughs> but it is, it is very frustrating. And uh, you did well. You handled that well, Eric. I mean, these are they're just things going on that uh, just, it's harder than it has to be. Instead of just help us get to a yes, help us figure it out. It's no, 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 no. And, uh, you know, it's costing us a lot of time on the cafeteria, and, you know, as well as some other things. So just just know that and we'll work through it. It's uh, 
hopefully we're going to get to a better place there. That that whole uh, process is being really looked at, even from the commissioner on down. It's being addressed, but it's you know Eric and uh, Melody both work with that group quite a bit, and it's it's just very frustrating. I learned in the army sometimes you got to play the game. There you go. This is the yeah. game. <laughs> Any other questions? I need a motion to approve. A motion by Mr. Johar. Second. Second on Ms. Wells. All in favor of considering the revised AG1 for the Renaissance Center roof, please say aye. 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 All opposed? <coughs> All right, we'll move down now to item F to consider purchase of Munis employee self service. Thank you. Thank you again. This one I'm, I'm actually I'm really excited about because I think this is a huge benefit to our employees. Um, I've held off on this for numerous years just because of the expense. And now that we have some of these ESSER funds, it's not it's not a huge expense, but I'm tight and 28,000 was not something I wanted to spend. So now it's something I do. Um, the great thing about it is the our current processes only allow when somebody gets their their pay stub. Uh, I've worked with Jarrett on trying to, you know, find some of these old emails. If you don't get your pay stub through the email, it's gone. It is in the ether and we cannot retrieve it. So the only way that I can give someone a record of that pay is to print out uh, a Munis report that nine times out of ten the bank calls me on and says, all right, walk me through this. So this will allow people to get their pay stubs. Um, W-2s, if someone wants a W-2 right now, they have to call me, I reprint it, I either hand deliver it to them or I mailed it to them. This will allow them to go online, download their W-2 in a secure PDF. It allows them to do that. Um, if they want to change banks, you know, a lot, I mean, it, it's it's eliminating a lot of manual process where they want to change banks. I tell them to print out that form and that they have to physically bring in a check and that form to me. And that's just to prevent fraud because you may not know who's sending you that that bank. You know, you take that bank account and you're paying someone else. And, it, and then that, that person calls me and says, where's my money? So I'm really excited about this. It's a really good product. They log into a, a portal, and get all this information. Um, there's some one-time cost, but then the, the annual cost thereafter about 4,000 a year. So I think it's a, a good thing. I think it's a convenience for our staff and I'm really glad to bring this. To you. And I'll say what, you know, you know, an employer of this large number of people, you know, we may have that availability yeah. to them. I mean, I know <clears throat> just people applying for loans, things like that, you know, you got to approve. I just stand. Yeah. And, and really, I mean, the, the, the biggest thing that made it glaring for me was a couple weeks ago, someone needed a W-2 while well, they upgraded the system. So then I couldn't print. And so I've had to call Munis. And Munis is not, Munis must, they must work with KDE's yeah. construction. <laughs> <laughs> because it took me two days to print a W-2. I mean, it, it shouldn't take that long to print a W-2. Um, so I I think it's a benefit I'll, and I'll shut up. So. I'll make a motion to approve. Second. Second one as well. <clears throat> All in favor of considering the purchase of the Munis Employee Self-Service, please say aye. 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 <laughs> uh, this is the vaccine incentive payment. The state of Kentucky announced it was going to be providing about $8 million to the state in order to provide a reimbursement of $100 for a vaccine incentive for state employees. Uh, the state allowed the flexibility of districts to adjust the payment to each employee, employee uniformly. Um, the Muhlenberg County Board of Education, we recommend that this payment be $110. That way they clear $100. Uh, so we'll just take the FICA and Medicare and it, believe it or not, the teachers will also have FICA and Medicare taken out because it is not a retirement um, based payment. So this way everyone gets the same amount. So it's the 7.62 on everyone's payment. Thank you. Motion by Mr. Jill Second by Ms. Barr. <clears throat> All in favor of considering the vaccine instead of payment of $110, please say aye. 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 
All opposed? I need to extend from the next one before I start seeing the one. Moving down now, item eight, as <laughs> uh, to consider purchase of three buses. Now you get it. Now I get it. <laughs> <laughs> one of them is not free. Uh, we consider the purchase of two standard buses and one special needs bus. Um, the, I, as you all know, I budget two annually uh, standard buses, so we're, we'd like to purchase two standard buses, the special education, Bus, we Medicaid funds, and the total cost is three hundred thirty-nine thousand three hundred sixty. Although I will ask that you allow. Um, I got a call from Kim, and on the special education bus, they would like to make it a, a little bit larger, which increases the the I believe it was five thousand dollars. So if you make a motion, if you allow me in your motion to increase the cost if if needed to accommodate the larger bus. That's up to five thousand more. I, I I believe it's 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 the work somewhere in in that five thousand range is what I was told. So, so you go to that three hundred forty right now. Correct. So three hundred forty-five thousand would should should cover that. <clears throat> I'll make a motion. All in favor of considering the purchase, the purchase of three buses, I'm buying purses, I'm here. Um, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I don't know. You need a purse, I think. Thank you. <laughs> All right, so we'll move down now to item I to consider COVID related protocols. Mr. Davis. Thank you, Chairman Rager, board members. I'm going to, I'm going to take a bit to kind of go through basically how I've been thinking about this and, and some of the information I've been gathering. I'm not going to make recommendations. I'm going to talk about things I think we should consider. And I'm going to look at it as, as three layers. It's basically the way I'm going to lay it out. So first I want to thank, and this is sincere. I want to thank our parents, uh, our community, our staff. Uh, this, has been, uh, this has been a really tough run. And even though we've got folks all over the board, even in my family, you know, on this, they have been respectful. I mean, and consistently, uh, and that was illustrated again tonight. You know, I'm out and about. I've talked to people, you know, all over the county. I'm in, I'm everywhere, and uh, no one has been in any way other than respectful. They've disagreed, you know, and all that's fair. And I can never ask that at the end of this that they agree with everything I I say or do, or agree with you guys. What I hope that folks will do is give us the benefit of the doubt that we are trying to do the right thing. Uh, we weigh these things and this is not easy. Now a couple months ago, even last month, we were at a point where it really uh, it, it was a fairly easy call. You know, our numbers were so high, uh, most people would have would have agreed, you know, that we kind of had to do what we had to do. And if you get down to where your zeros across the board, well, that's an easy call. But we are now in, in the range, which I knew when we got here, it would be a little tough, a little controversial, but it's a good thing that because that means we're now, we're able to have some, some conversations about where do we go and what can we do? So I wanna start with uh, things to consider, things that uh, I weigh in my mind every day as we, just, we try to decide what is the best thing to do. And certainly our numbers are absolutely critical to that. I'm looking at that. It's, uh, pretty much every day uh, we're getting up, updates on where are staff positives and quarantines, what's our rate on that map. That map uh, is, is tricky to be the end all, I think. You know, it's setting up a metric is really difficult for this. I kind of like the way we're doing it. I know some may not, but kind of talking about it each month and weighing multiple, multiple things and having a conversation. If you just go by the map, and some do, and that's okay. Uh, but you know, that, that can jump back and forth pretty easily. And, it, you know, there was a time where, you know, the jump was, it was all because of a single nursing home or something. So I like to look at several different things. The state positivity rate, you say, why does that matter? That does matter to me. If the whole state is kind of dropping and getting down there, that's that's a good indication, I think, that we're likely to, to stay lower. And if it jumps, the state does, then that's a probably good likelihood we're going to follow. So I do watch that. What about other districts? You know, and some would say it doesn't matter about other districts. We're, we're Muhlenberg. 
Well, it does. It does to me because when I talk to a superintendent and we talk daily, I talk to 15 other superintendents on a text and then many more uh, outside of that, but absolutely daily we are throwing things out and we're comparing and we're talking. So why does it matter what other districts do? Well, certainly if you get into some things like sports, we are actually playing each other. We're going back and forth and we're actually inter intermingling. But even other than that, I'm, I'm confident that you folks, whether it be a bank or a hospital or a restaurant or a distillery, you're interested in what others are doing. You know, now does that mean we have to follow the leader? We have never followed the leader, but I do weigh that. So when McLean does something or Hancock does something and Davis does something, that interests me because when I talk to their superintendents, they have talked to their health departments and their board members and their doctors and also I get all that resource, all that knowledge to help make a, a, a smart decision. So other districts, what they're doing, you know, some of them have gone optional masking earlier. That interests me. I want to watch that. I want to see what happens and talk to them and say, hey, what's going on and is it working for you? You know, that map does matter. We have been orange for two weeks and I, I said I think that was kind of a big deal and I do. Uh, that is that's an that's an important thing for me. Booster shots are available. Some you know not that everybody wants them, but that is something that's out there. I think that is a factor. Five to eleven year olds can now get the vaccine if they so choose. I don't know if they're far enough in where they could have got you know two rounds of it, but it, uh, we're just like two percent in the county have done that so far. But that is starting, and that, that is something that matters to me. What happened if all break? What happened after fall break? I mean, what happened after Halloween? Well, in this case, unlike last year, we didn't get the big bump. That's very encouraging. Um, you know, yes, as a state, we have we dropped and then we're kind of inching a little bit. You know, we're watching. Are we going back up or are we plateauing? But it is very good news, I think, when we think about Thanksgiving. Hopefully that's going to be a positive thing as well. Hopefully Thanksgiving, we won't see a jump after that either. But it is encouraging that after fall break and Halloween, we did not. Um, I talked to a lot of folks that have uh, have a lot of expertise. I talked to Kathy Bethel often. I talked to Ed Heat often. I talked to Dr. Billy Gallion. She's been a big help. She's always there for me. Dr. Bandy, I can reach out to him. Like I said, other superintendents. And it's also, even though we haven't put out a survey or anything like that, I understand that that's a reasonable thing that he said. I get that. I do talk to a lot of staff members, a lot of parents, and I talk to kids. Um, I'm in schools every day. And so all that stuff kind of weighs in as you kind of try to decide, all right, where do we go from here? And we have tests to stay now. That's going pretty well. Had some bumps early, but that is helpful. And occasionally we get some state guidance. Um, I did meet with, I, not personally, but all the superintendents met with the commissioner and some folks from the state department. Um, Tuesday of this week and you know it's kind of listening to them some so having said all that you know as I'm kind of trying to work this through in our mind does it have to be an all or nothing you know if ultimately it is obviously it is your guys decision and if you're like I'm not ready to do everything at once uh, can we consider the layered approach so I want to talk about three layers in my mind that you know you could either either think about all three of them or or one or two or three of them but to me, the first one and the one I think we should at least strongly consider is like it's sporting events and it's not because uh, we love sports the most or anything like that. And it can appear that way. Here's my thinking on this. As far as I know, all the other schools in our region are optional masking at gym and, you know, at sporting events and we play them. So you're talking about if we play half of our games or half of our events, are on the road. So the same fans, uh, pretty much the same, everybody, they're going to Ohio County, McLean County, Hancock County and all this, and it's optional. And then you come back to our place and, you know, if it's not in, at this moment, it's not, you know, are we, are we gaining anything there? Or is that something we could consider as a, as a level one, a layer one, you know, maybe, maybe that's when we peel back, um, considering that we do intermingle so much with those other districts anyway. It's going to happen because, again, we're, we're going on the road half the time. And so that's that's kind of layer one. Uh, you could get into a little more specific if you want to. You know, you could say, well, what about at Felix Martin Hall? Uh, what about academic needs? You know, some of those things. And honestly, there you're really not going back and forth. 
you know, with, with the sporting events you are. But, you you know, you could lump them all together, but I'm just kind of throwing it all out. You could you could consider that. But I think the, the most obvious ones that folks have come to me about and and what I hear the most is it does it. I don't want to say it doesn't make sense. I mean, anytime you're trying to be safe, it makes sense. But should this be something to consider since we are constantly doing this, playing playing there. And like I said, I think we're the only one in the region uh, at this point that are that's mandating. So that's something to consider. Level two is the in school. Um, this is kind of the big one. Uh, we have several around us that have gone optional and there are some that are still kind of some have already said, hey, we're waiting until January and we're kind of reevaluating now. So the in school one uh, again. I've seen a lot of positive things happen in other districts and I've, I've illustrated that. I think it's only fair to say that I do know of four districts who went optional and they have gone back now to mandated. Several haven't, not all of them, but I, I, I think I know I know of at least four now. That's concerning. I mean, that's something that, you know, I, I do take a look at, um, but I do think you're we're flat in, in my mind. We're flat in the gray area. I mean, it, we're right there in the gray area where I think you could have folks that say it's time. You know, I, this gentleman here, you know, I've got a, I've got a kindergartner. I've got his mask on a long time. And that's pretty aggravating. And it's time to take it. That's a reasonable when you when you talk through it. That's reasonable. It's also reasonable to say, you know, we dropped, but you see these other districts kind of drop and then go back. Do we want to go in and out? It's also reasonable to think, you know, maybe you wait to December and take the look there. I, it's it's totally reasonable to have a conversation and we did the other day and kind of went back and forth on that a little bit. So I think to me that's layer two, the in school. If you want to do a sub layer to that, uh, there are some districts that are masking only when moving and doing some different things with that. But to me that that level two one, uh, layer two, that's what do we do with the masking, you know, in the schools actually when they're inside. That's a closed system. That's not like the sporting events when you're going back and forth. That's what's different about that. You got more control there. And then level three, layer three, that's buses. That's a federal thing. Uh, right now, the, the federal government is still saying, you know, buses, you have to be masked. But I mean, that is something that we're going to have to look at at some point. But right now, quite honestly, we don't have an option on it. So the, those are the three layers in my mind. You know, when do you peel them back? How many you peel back at once? You know, we're kind of at a point where we can have some good honest talks about this. Maybe it's time to, to, to peel back a little bit, but we do meet back again. I think in about three and a half weeks worth of school days, the sporting events do start pretty much, I guess, pretty much any time. So that's something I think we should consider. I will say, and this is not part of this, I don't think we're at the point where we want to be doing any rental of facilities. You know, I think if we do something in the gyms, it's to help our kids and our folks. I don't know if we want to rent it out. We haven't yet. I personally don't think we're there yet. I do want to get back to mentoring. Our kids need mentoring. This is not anything you have to vote on. I'm just kind of talking through uh, because it all falls under the COVID kind of thing. And I'm not going to do that just yet. I will tell you, but that is something we're trying. Our, our kids need this, so we need to figure out a way. I think we're getting really close to be able to do some one on one, you know, in a safe way there. So in certain volunteers in our school, we've really kept folks out for the most part. And I am getting some, hey, can I come in and see my kid? Can I come in and see that? And I get that. I think we're getting really close to that. But just to just kind of throwing it out there, you know, I'm probably not going to be putting many facilities requests in front of you. If any, we talked about that before. So I'm I'm willing to uh, this is a controversial thing. There is no other way around it. This is not simple. Anybody that thinks it's simple, I'm not sure they've they've thought it through. Uh, this is you. This weighs on you. I, I really want to. I want to keep our kids safe, and I want to move forward. And you know, it's, it's with, we're right in that range now. On when do we when do we pull the trigger on what? I think it's so important that our folks have hope. That we are getting to a better place and we want to get to a better place. I'm hopeful. I am. I'm a little worried. Yeah, they've got other things, the other variants out there. Those are all real. Those are things we're watching. But I'm so excited where we are now compared to where we were one and two months ago. So you you know, you guys can discuss this and I'll try to answer any question, but I went through a long, long list of things right there. But that's my world. That's what's in my mind, at least a part of it. 
Uh, that and sports. Uh, I'd watch in Kentucky. <laughs> That's what's in my mind most of the time. But uh, I'll answer any of this. They, you know, I'm glad you brought that up. Kathy Bethel in particular is the one that I talk to the most about this. Uh, and the, the doctors are put on board as well with the ones I've talked to, so I don't want to pick anyone out. I haven't no. talked to them in the last week or so. Kathy Bethel, I have. And she is totally fine with the layered approach. I mean, she said that makes that makes sense. Uh, I did bring this up to the superintendent, the group I'm with. I'm like, talk me through this. And some of them are like, you know, I like I like that approach. And some have said, nope, it's all or nothing. Uh, I get that too. This anytime you do layers and you got a little gray areas inside the layer, so we got to work through some things. But it just seems it seems reasonable to think about it in layers. And that doesn't mean you can't do all the layers at one time, but that's that's what's in my mind. I don't think everything is exactly the same. Certainly buses aren't. Buses are off the board. That's really not anything to discuss, but I do want to bring it up because I, I occasionally get both things on buses. I, you have some drivers that are worried that if we go non-masking, you know, they're on a, on a bus there right now with a lot of kids. And, and then I've got some that like, you know, gosh, they got to ride that bus the whole time with the mask, especially when it's hot. All that's real. All that I get, all that I totally understand. And so um, this is, like I said, not a simple thing, not in my mind, but these are considerations to throw out there. And then whatever conversations you guys want to have and any questions you've got, I'll answer them as best I possibly can. Am I correct if we change the mask, masking policy for in school and that are quarantined could go back up because those students aren't? Mask if they're exposed. Yes, to the mask. there there is there is truth to that. Yes, there is a there's a concern now. Yes, hundred percent. The what we're happy about now is our our cases are so low or getting so low that that wouldn't be as much of a factor as we think. But yes, that's the concern in school is is the big one. You know they're closer to each other, so especially with the high school. Well, and, and, and we've got some larger classes even in elementary and other places, but that is a concern. So some have actually changed quarantine rules. Uh, and, you know, the state did that a, a bit back whenever you were vaccinated. They allowed, you know, you didn't have to be. And so test to stay has helped. But yes, ma'am. And it seems like today the numbers have jumped up some again, like the 16 in the county. We didn't have a great day. I did see that. Now, we'll, obviously, I want to see is that something that's lagged over two or three days? We've done that before, but that is that's not the number you want to see. I think that's a very valid concern too and I think it is also fair to say though that you we may have to you know it, even if you say all right we're going to do the the sporting events that makes that makes sense let's let's do that and then if you see something there you we can obviously but you know what let's clamp it back down uh, we've done it before and so that is something that that, that I'm not afraid to do, but at the same time, you'd rather not go in and out, in and out, mass today. Some are going, we're going to look at every Thursday and, and do something different the next week. I, I kind of like what we're doing, looking at it at a month. I, I mean, I kind of do. I'm sure some would disagree. I don't have an exact metric, but nobody's talking this with any more depth than we're talking right now. So, yeah, those, those are valid concerns, but I don't want to be too fearful of moving forward because we may have to go back that we never that we're always kind of paralyzed to do it but at the same time it is fair to ask that question are we there enough I mean we just we just got two weeks today and we're at 20 you know 22 so if red is a big deal to you and it, it is something we certainly look at we may be red tomorrow I mean so you know I don't know uh, and some districts have gone at the optional and been just fine so you know it's just to be fair, I'm looking in both, but I'm trying to just give you all the data that I have and everything that I'm hearing. You know, I get that. You know, I got two kids going to school as well, and nobody's happy wearing masks, including myself. But when you said the two board members who have lost their brothers and talk, trying talking to them, and it's like a job, you know, and. We're just working through the little actions and not have talk just because, you know, let them feel like, let them tell how they feel and what they think. Yeah, and I think it's fair, I should, I should say, it's fair to say that, yes, absolutely, they come from, you, you two come from very 
tough experiences, but I've talked to both of you individually and you've listened. I mean, you've listened and you've waited. So that's all I can ever ask is that I just kind of lay it out there and it's not like, no, I don't even want to talk about this. You have absolutely listened and asked questions. Uh, you My know, major concern is that we have two major holidays coming up. And people don't interact. And they're going to have to make school kids interact too. So I think we need to wait until at least after the first of the year. And if you know, we're in good shape, take them off. If we're not, uh, it's a whole lot easier to keep them on than it is to put them back on. Yeah, I understand it. And uh, to be totally balanced, you know, most other events now in the county, yeah. including churches and everywhere else, it is optional. And I mean, just, just being fair to that, and the good news is we have dropped into the orange with that going on. Uh, but we are kind of the biggest business and we have the most most folks together. That's, that's reasonable oh, to say too. Well. You know, we do have the biggest business. We have the most people together. We have the most people going back home and exposing family members. And speaking personally, um, as a board member who has lost a brother to COVID-19, um, no family should have to go through that. No family should have to watch a family member die when you can't be there. And if you have not experienced that, I pray to God every day that you don't have to do that. Um, it, Mr. Davis talked with me yesterday and we went through a lot of things and you know this the whole sporting event thing i i'm really torn about that because i know people are going to gather and they're going to gather in those big spaces um, and they're going to go home and they're going to expose one another and we've we've had masks on now for quite a while and something's working The vaccine may or may not work for you, depending on how careful, how careful you are out in the public. Case in point, um, one of my brothers is fully vaccinated, went to a football game with other people who weren't vaccinated, didn't wear a mask, didn't really care about his surroundings, and now he and my other brother have COVID-19, so that's three of my brothers who have had it recently. Um, so this is a tough decision for me. And if you have not been on a school board and sat and looked at parents and people in your in your community and some of them saying things that you know you can't tell me what to do with my child, um, we're here to protect the majority of people in this community. Um, we might not all agree on things. And I, Mr. McGill, I, I commend you for coming here tonight. Thank you. I know how passionate you are about about this subject and. I understand. Thank you. Thank you for being a part of this. I've lost two friends this past week. Both of them were vaccinated. And I agree, you don't want to, nobody should have to go through, through that. And if we have tools to protect the majority, why not use them? Uh, what's it going to, I mean, what's another month till after Christmas going to? Gonna, it's not. It's just a few weeks, and get through the holiday season, and and then reevaluate after we get back to see where we're at. Because, uh, like she's, everybody's not at the same degree of caution or, or carefulness. I see that every day, and you don't know how it's gonna affect you or your child. I mean, I read somewhere where 26 year old died today. You know, I read that or that headline. So. It's not always uh, just older people or you know compromised people. It, it's it's not uh, selected in that way always. So I will always err on my side of caution. I don't know very well what it's like. I mean, I haven't lost a family member to COVID, but I have been the nurse there when their family couldn't be there many times during this, um, and it's a tough place to be in as well, even if it's not my family. For that moment, their last moments, I am their family, um, and it's been been very difficult. Um, you know, we are seeing a lot smaller numbers, but you know, we've been there before, and then the bottom fell out. Numbers went right back up. Um, so we just don't know. Uh, I, we have been cautious as a board. I feel like we've, you know, been cautious because we care about our students, we care about our staff, we care about our our families. Um, 
you know, as far as the sporting events, I also understand, you know, if we're requiring masks and none of the other districts are, and we're traveling there and they're coming here, you know, there's a lot smaller number of students and staff um, that attend the ball games, you know, outside of school, then you're going to see students and staff in the school on a day-to-day -day basis in school in a confined area. So I can understand the reasoning for wanting to be optional in a layered approach, starting with the sporting events. Um, I feel like numbers are decreasing for the most part. And like Susan said today, you know, we did have a bigger jump than we have been seeing. Um, and we don't know if that's a collection of a few days tallying up today. It just happens to be a bigger, bigger number, um, which is why I guess they look at the seven day average. But with that being said, um, you know, I feel like our students and our athletes and our, our parents and all with things trending in the right direction, we have to at some point in time make a decision to move forward. Um, and that's just my personal, you know, thought on it as well. So, you know, I feel like, you know, we have to at some point in time make that step. So, and that's why maybe the layered is, is that's why maybe that's more reasonable than, you know, rather than waiting till it's all time. I'm just kind of right. in my mind. Right. You know, we don't want to be police officers. We want happiness. We want people to feel comfortable. We don't want to keep on making rules. No, no, no. We don't want to be negative land use, but, you know, it's some concern. And we'd like to open up in the small areas, you know, sporting maybe the area to start with. But if that number goes up, then January and all that talk is over. Right. Well, in, in a large extent, no matter what we do, it's going to be the same with sports because we're going everywhere else. Right. You know, and, and, and our folks aren't, you know, they're not going to be required just because they're from Newburgh County. When right. they go to Ohio County, they're not required. So right. that's that's the, that's seen, that's my thinking. That's you know. the opening point, you know, getting the gates open kind of thing, doors open and, but you know, hope to God it don't come back for the higher numbers, then this in school thing topic might not be valid for next thing. So are we are we voting tonight on um, wearing masks until January or are we going to reevaluate after Thanksgiving? Do we have that option? My my well, you can do whatever you want. You're the you're the you're the board. <laughs> but my <laughs> suggestion would be to say, you know, whatever you decide, uh, to allow or disallow it now is to revisit this in December. December, you're one day before the break. Right. And so you're not going to change it then immediately. But if you if you decide not to go, say, in school, then December, when you come in, you've got Thanksgiving numbers, you've got some other things to look at. And, you know, you could also, if it's, if it's really just, if it goes crazy, then you also look at sports. If you decide not to go optional there, and we'll call it recommended is what we'll put up. But then you can always go and say, you know what, we're going that the other way. So I would suggest you can always go on to, the, to January, but you're going to get more up to date data if you wait till December and make that call. But you can make a call now and, and change it. Our sports are starting on you got a lot of a lot of sporting events going on and then you've got a, but i think from this board meeting to the next one because of january because of thanksgiving i think you only have maybe 17 in school days so there's not a lot of in school days but you know you're going to have about four weeks worth of data there um but yeah the sporting events well and that's something to note it's not that you're saying you can't work um, you know, there there is a place to have choice, and and uh, you know I understand it. I understand where Mr. McGill's coming from. There's no hatefulness there. There's just a, a reasonable opinion. I don't blame him. I've got a I've got a, a great great grandson in the first grade and a great granddaughter in the seventh grade. So, you know, but my whole thing is to protect them. You know, and you know, nobody likes wearing a mask. No. Uh, I know little kids don't. Uh, yeah. They go to school with a 
spun Bob on and come back for the Spider Man. And, and the whole district shuts down. <laughs> Uh, you know, and, and again, it, it doesn't totally matter what other districts do, but I do. You do weigh that, and I would say, like on on the first layer, it's almost a hundred percent on optional, and then the in school, it's probably 50-50-50, and you have gone back, and then on buses, it's a hundred percent mandated, just because that's a Fed thing. So if those if that those number matter, it does matter to me some. I feel like it's important for in school purposes. You know, to get to the holidays and see how our numbers are. There's going to be a lot more gatherings than probably on a normal week to week basis right now. Lots of people coming from different places and gathering together. Um, now, personally, I feel like the end school and that thing <coughs> needs to be continued to be mandatory until after the first week at least. I agree with that and I understand the, the sporting events and. I can see the logic in that with when they're going to other counties and doing well, that. So, but I obviously, we need to pay attention yeah. if it changes. The people who are on the recommend that they wear a mask. I do too. You know, it don't have to be. We well, can we, we can put, put that, that up. Mask 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 you know, with that woman masking them. Well, and it's like this, you know, like you, you know, you're vaccinated. You, you know, you're the son wear a mask. If you go to a ball game. That's, you know, it's optional. You can do that. No one's going to say a word to you, you know, and, and most people that are, are concerned about contracting this virus, you know, if they're that concerned about contracting it, they're going to be vaccinated. They're going to wear their masks. They're going to take every precaution that they can to protect themselves and their families because, you know, but they may want to go see their granddaughter or their grandson cheer or play ball, you know, and that's perfectly fine, you know, if they, and that's, that's their choice. That's their. Well, I'm going to be sitting down there where they're going to all be standing up behind me screaming and yelling. Yeah. True. <laughs> Blowing all that stuff down that way. You know. mm -hmm. I'll be intera interacting with the referees and the ball players too. So it's, you know, I'm going to wear a mask. Uh, you know, I, whether it was optional or whatever, you know, I still wear my mask. I don't wear it at work because I'm behind the uh, shield. Last, uh, flexible shield. So. so we can do a recommendation. I mean, we can do it, um, you know, sports only. We can do it in school only. We can do it all the same. I mean, and really, you don't have to. The board up at this point. And you don't have to say anything about the buses, probably, because it's yeah. just there's nothing to be said there, really. I'll make a motion to make the sports optional masking at this point. Um, I'm seconded. Just to support somewhere we start this. But if it comes back with the higher numbers, the topic would not be done for the next three months. Please note it down. So, Chairman Rager, are you going to make the motion? Is it going to be? Is it going to be just sure. just that? Are you going to roll them both in? Right yeah. Oh, gotcha. All right. Um, that way, there's no confusion as to what the vote is about. Um, so, yeah, I've made a motion to recommend optional masking for sports events. Mr. Johar has seconded that. Um, all in favor of voting for optional masking for sporting events in our district. Please say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? I hear none. And then uh, we can do in school now. Uh, and thoughts on recommendations for that. How, how we go through Thanksgiving. Yeah. And like, like Susan said, I know we talked about this a thousand times, but I mean, at this point, we're better safe than sorry. Um, I don't want to make a decision to let people go optional masking in school and then have to pull it back and have more people exposed. Um, so I'm always going to err on the side of caution. I will do. 
if I have a motion by Mr. Johar to revisit the in-school uh, masking for next month. Yes. <clears throat> I will second. And second. So all in favor of reevaluating for um, in-school optional masking for next month, please say aye. Aye. Uh, all opposed? So we'll move down now to our um, added item J, and that is to consider job posting of school based mental health care provider. Good evening. Good evening. I'm going to leave my, my screen off so maybe my computer won't mess up. Um, but we received a phone call from KDE this week and we were notified that we have an additional $43,095 to apply toward an additional school based mental health care provider. And you may remember that we received the same amount of funds last year and we used the funds to contract with two part-time guidance counselors. Um, we do not have those contracts in place anymore. We started off the school year without those in place, but we uh, would like to revisit that and recommend that we go through the process that we did last year to find someone um, who possesses one of the following credentials, either a school counselor, a school psychologist, or a school-based social worker. And I think now is a good time to revisit some of the statistics that I was going to share um, earlier when um, Mr. Davis was talking and he did a very nice job at reviewing terrorist metrics. Uh, but through our trainings with terrorist metrics, we uh, were told to expect that for every 100 students, that about seven of those were going to need follow up within 24 hours, meaning that they had a priority score of one, um, so based on responses, they showed um, loneliness, um, issues with bullying, feelings of isolation, low resiliency factors, um, and not as high on the positive things like hope and grit and things like that. So what we're finding is that through our assessments, which began last week, that about seven out of 20 students in our district are priority one, meaning about seven out of 20 students are requiring immediate follow up within those 24 hours. And that is putting um, a lot of work on the guidance counselors and they're absolutely um, feeling that that void. Uh, they are providing those one on one conversations with students and they're working very hard to meet the needs of those students and make referrals as necessary. So um, I thought this was a good time to bring those statistics up because any additional help that we have in the area of counseling for our students is a much needed time for a lot of different reasons. So I would hope that you would consider this and allow this position to remain in effect for the life of the grant as deemed necessary by district leadership. Considering the job posting of a school-based mental health care provider, please say aye. 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 All opposed? Can I ask one more question for clarification? I know we've already done it and it won't change the vote, but Julie, um, did you say out of every 100 students, seven will normally need help? Yes. Uh, in our trainings with Rich Gilman, he's the creator of the program. He advised us to expect that out of every 100 students that about seven would need immediate follow up, meaning within 24 hours. And so because of that, we are rolling this survey out uh, very slowly. You know, at one point we talked about, well, let's maybe do all sixth grade at one time and then all seventh grade at one time. But our counselors had a lot of intuition there and wanted to go even slower. So they're going classroom by classroom. And um, we've had several classrooms already complete the assessments. Um, as so far, I think the fewest number per 20 students has been three, but the vast majority of classrooms, of average classroom of 20 kids, about seven of those are needing immediate follow up. So it is taking much longer. We really wanted to have this done by Thanksgiving, but Christmas break looks like uh, a more reasonable deadline for us. 
And do you think that is is solely based on the last couple of years with students being more isolated because of COVID? Or do you think that's something local? Well, I definitely think that plays um, a role in it because some of the items do gear toward loneliness and isolation and just by, you know, how we've had to live for the past couple of years or a year and a half, you know, um, our students feel that just like we do, if, if not more at times, because this is a time that they want to be social and need to be social. And and of course, a lot of them aren't able to do that. And, you know, this, these questions also ask things like, um, you know, they're geared toward depression, self-harming statements, and if they respond, you know, in a certain way to those, that's an immediate, someone's going to talk to them. So it can be just more of an undercurrent or it could be something more significant like a, um, thoughts of, of dying. All right, thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Julie. Thank you. All right, so now we're down to our board consent agenda items. Um, that would be to approve the minutes of the prior board meetings, consider leave of absence requests, declare surplus, and approve disposal disposal of broken and outdated technology equipment. We we'll probably have a microwave in here that needs to go. Come on, bring it to buddy. Consider field trip requests. He's a at least they didn't catch on fire. <laughs> 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 they yeah. I'll make a motion to approve the board consent agenda item. Second. Second by Ms. Wills. All in favor of approving the board consent agenda item, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I hear none. And then we are down to a gun. Mr. Bowers. Mr. Bowers, all in favor of adjourning, please say aye. 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 All opposed? I hear none. And we are adjourned. Thank you all. Yeah,